because I think that's fun. And we can dive into that more later about why we think that. So um, I'm Katie, and I'm the senior brand manager at Go Factory. And I have a background in the music industry and media industries with a specialty in digital marketing and uh, business development. So I'm the former marketing director for a company called Cloud9 Adventures, which is a producer of music festivals on cruise ships and international resorts. So that was a very fun job. We had to travel a lot. And then I also ran special projects in audience development and complex media, which is a millennial uh, convergence culture media platform that gets over 50 million unique users a month. So lots and lots of heavy millennial traffic there. So um, my favorite platform is Snapchat, though I spend most of my time on LinkedIn for obvious purposes. And uh, my least favorite platform is Facebook. So we can dive more into that later. So I'm going to hand things off to my colleague, Nicole, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her Hi, guys. Um, I'm Nicole. I'm the director of strategy for Echo Factory. I'm staying inside of our full service agency. So social media for our clients varies across the clients that we have and the industries that they're involved in. Um, so I'm excited to be here to talk to you guys, to answer any questions, and give my perspective from the strategy side. Um, my favorite platform from the business side is Pinterest. I think there's a lot of room for advertising there and for um, the purchase power, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in that platform that hasn't quite been tapped into yet. My least favorite at the moment, and this is totally from that advertising side, is Snapchat. <laughs> a little bit um, clunky to use, and it's interesting how they're going to kind of change that for advertising and for companies moving forward. So I'll pass on the mic, and uh, thank you everyone for having me. Hi everybody, my name is Malcolm. I work at Live Nation. Um, uh, so my job is I do social media for national touring for clubs and theater division for Live Nation as well as do some blogging for the Once to Watch Emerging Artist Music side. And I would say, professionally, my favorite platform would be Facebook, because the app is just robust, you know? And it has a lot of data. Um, personally, Instagram, so I'm in the same families. And least favorite would it be Pinterest. At the moment. <laughs> Instagram stuff. 
stories. I think it's a great way to be raw and not afraid to just throw things out there. Um, and yeah, I'm just looking forward to everything that this city is doing and growing. And um, I just look forward to exploring it and featuring it. Hi, I'm Tara. Um, I head up partnerships and business development at a company called Epoxy. Uh, we are a startup based in Venice. Uh, we build software for, um, it's a social media management tool that's optimized for video content creators. So that's a lot of different words. Uh, so basically people that have a video channel on YouTube uh, or a social media um, presence across of various platforms can utilize our, um, our software to be able to help them do everything much easier. Um, that's the best way to describe it. Uh, my favorite social platform is Instagram. Um, I tend to find a lot of, 90% of the things that I find, I find through the rabbit holes of the hashtags that I go down. Um, I follow a bunch of different people, different events that I've attended, you know, small business owners will be like, how did you find out about this? And it always tends to be Instagram. Um, I think it's a really good discovery platform um, if used the right way. Uh, my least favorite, and it's just because I can't figure it out yet, is probably Snapchat, but I'm getting there. One day I will become a very... <laughs> Uh, but I think it's a really creative and, and it's very interesting the way that different brands and um, just individuals in general are starting to use it. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm part of Apple's business team here. Uh, I also run an event company outside of here focused on competitive video gaming. Uh, so I'm here kind of as a uh, tech person to give you extra insight. Uh, so I spend most of my time at Apple consulting companies around software and hardware strategies. So I think I'll have a good amount to offer. Uh, and just to clarify, I don't speak for Apple. I just speak for myself. <laughs> <laughs> None of us speak for Apple, I guess. Yeah. None of us is representing our company. Um, so yeah, that's great, guys. Thanks. So um, if we're just going to go ahead and dive into some topics and um, try to stay on time here because we have a lot of different things we want to try to discuss. So my first question, I'm going to aim it towards um, towards you guys, Paul and Malcolm, because you work for larger companies. And um, just want to go ahead and tackle the subject of the separation of personal and business accounts. And uh, how does that work within your companies? And how do you personally manage separating the two? And then maybe, Taryn, you can speak to how you are your business account. So if you guys can maybe speak to that a little bit. Sure. Um, so with Path Forward specifically, uh, we actually have about 30 different employees in different markets who are running marketing in their local markets. And part of Path's ethos is to be as local as possible while being this macro priority. So we let them um, set up their own professional accounts um, for Instagram and Twitter, and they're currently operating those. Um, and we have it, and this is separation of church and state really on, on personal and professional um, because I don't want to be monitoring people's personal pages, you know, um, but there is a piece of our business that does affect the local markets and so they have professional accounts there. Um, I do have a horror story from a previous owner. I've been at PAPS for three years and we had an owner change my one year in and the previous owners would actually follow everyone on social media, like their personal accounts, like the owners of the companies, like multi-millionaires. And uh, if you posted a photo with like a different beer, they would like hit you up and tell HR to tell you to remove it. Like it was insane. And so everyone basically had private accounts, so this couldn't happen. Um, but I really feel like it's up to the employee to decide whether or not to use their personal account to get the word out um, for the brand that they work for. Um, unless there's a business case for, like I said, for those local handles that we have, so. And do you rely on the employees at all to post, like, is that managed for, like, are they? Only, only the 30 that I referenced in different markets, um, that they're running sort of the local marketing on the ground for the brand. Those people are required to do it, but that's, you know, it's a business case okay. there, so, yeah. I'm on my side, uh, Live Nation doesn't need my help marketing any shows. <laughs> um, so I really don't have to deal with it that much um, for the touring side, but for the ones to watch side, which is a blog, any kind of content that I write, any kind of interview that I do, I make sure I share it on my 
my personal, but there's nothing mandatory for work uh, on my personal profile. And if it makes sense, I'll post it, but there's no like, or if I'm excited to work on a tour, like I tweeted out the other day that I'm working on the Lauryn Hill tour, and I was like, wow, if you told me 15 years ago I'd be doing this one day, I would have called you a liar. But like, little stuff, little exciting moments like that, but for the most part, I really don't have to uh, do anything. So speaking from the smaller business end, I definitely keep um, a personal Instagram account. That's actually where Pasadena Charm started. It started as a hashtag. So I was walking with my son around Pasadena, seeing everything that was going on. I was hashtag Pasadena. Then I started Pasadena Charm as its own business separate account. And I had, I did not do my face. I would do, you see people do a lot of their feet or their hair or their hands or their coffee. So that's how Pasadena Charm started. And then um, a local florist here, a dear friend of mine, said, Taryn, you really need to put your face because you're a, a lifestyle blogger. So I said, okay, that was a very scary moment for me, but I decided to put my name and start showing my face because I think you really need to treat your followers like you want to be treated. So you want to tell a story and you want people to you know, like you, and then they'll like your brand. Um, but I work with a lot of small businesses around the community, helping them launch their Instagram, and I always tell them that you have to keep it separate. Um, I have a company that is a museum, and they asked me, um, Taryn, we really wanna do weddings. Um, should we call it dot dot weddings? I said no. For example, J. Crew has a wedding department, but they're not J. Crew weddings. They're still J. Crew and they have everything underneath. So I try to strategize um, and I try to stay mysterious. That's a really big thing. So a good tip is leading people to different avenues and different platforms. So on Twitter, I'll say, hey guys, I'm climbing this really tall ladder to grab something really gorgeous. Um, check it out on Snapchat. Snapchat to see what it is. So it's a really great way to tap into all forms. Um, but at the end of the day, I make hours. So my weekends are free. I'm trying not to post too much. Um, but I am my brand. Um, but I do think separation is really important. Um, your personal, people don't want to know what my child is eating for breakfast. Um, but my personal account isn't private. So if you really are like, I really want to get to know this person behind Pasadena Charm, um, it's there for them. But I'm not over posting. And when I go on vacation, I'm not over posting sunset pictures. And I feel like Tara really tapped into um, hashtags are so important. And I'll leave you with this one tip. Um, California, hashtag California has like 90 million posts. But California Livin, and that's without the G, it's like California Livin, is only, um, I don't know, like uh, 60,000 posts. So I find myself getting at those top posts. So that's really a way to um, get noticed by a lot of people is figuring out where your picture can end up in those top nine posts. Um, so it's really about practice, practice, and I would post two to three times a day because I learned so much. Okay, morning posts don't work, but nighttime is huge. I post at night, I say goodnight Pasadena, I wake up the next morning and it's gone crazy. Everybody's saying goodnight to me. Um, so, but doing that and posting three times a day, you're gonna see where your followers are, you're gonna see um, who's <laughs> engaging with you, and um, playing around with hashtags is really huge. Cool, thanks. We can get more into um, some best practices later, but I do wanna keep the conversation going. And Nicole, I do have a question for you about strategy, speaking as a social strategist um, and overall business strategist. Um, how did your company define its voice? Yeah, so like I said earlier, we work with um, several different clients across several different industries, and social media for each of them means something different. So when we develop a social media strategy, we first look at what profiles are relevant for their industry. If you skew younger, you're probably going to be on Snapchat. If you skew older or you're business to business, you're probably more likely to have, be more effective on LinkedIn. Um, so we, start, we use that as our starting point, what platforms. 
Then we move into um, what is your tone and voice and content. And when we develop content, we want to find the content that is most relevant to your community. I'm a big advocate of not posting for the sake of posting and making sure that when you are posting that it's engaging, it's relevant, it's something that your community cares about. So we really dive into the demographics of who your community is, what content they're reading, and that's sort of our baseline of how we develop the content. Um, from there, we move into the strategy of frequency. It's something that Taryn um, kind of touched on, but you want to make sure that you're not overly posting, you're not underly posting, um, but you're also making sure that the content that you are posting is relevant. So um, just a quick question to interject. Do you work off a content calendar, and what's your feeling of having a content calendar versus um, just random posting on the fly as you see fit or responding to people? What's the balance? There? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. It's something that we go back and forth with a lot. Um, one of the great things about social media is that it's ever-changing, and it's, it's constant, and you really need to have some sort of live um, component to it. You can't plan out a content <laughs> calendar three months in advance. Now you can do weekly content calendars so that you have copy ready to go, so that you're maintaining some sort of consistency, but it really is a balancing act of having current content and then the content that's relevant um, to, to your customers, but then also developing your own content. So what we do is we develop content calendars and we create types of content. Usually we'll have a custom piece of content that we've developed for um, a client. We'll have a question, which is some sort of engaging content. And then we'll have a slot that we'll leave open for current events. And that's where we can go in and search Twitter, search news, and retweet or repost content that is live and relevant. Um, it, it is somewhat of a balancing act. It is, it's a constant kind of balance. And it does depend on your type of company and approval processes and all of that. But it is super important to maintain both of those. And content is king. Making sure that it's relevant is definitely the biggest factor. And then balancing between having content that makes sense and then that's also live and current. And I think, too, that um, mm -hmm. I know that at Complex we had what we call evergreen content. Posts that did really well, and they will always be relevant. And you can repost them and bring them back from the dead and repost them. Or, or if you have a blog post that did really well, hey, maybe you didn't see this, and reposting it to LinkedIn, posting it to Twitter. Um, keeping those things going. Uh, so that evergreen content is really key, and you don't want it just to die with death. And, and, and it is relevant for Twitter, too. You can keep reposting things and putting them up, and, and they do really well. Um, what do you guys, do you use content calendars, or how does it work for you? Yeah, so it actually varies for us, because we do work on multiple brands. Um, but it was interesting hearing Nicole talk about just her process, because so for Pass Oregon, we have five brand managers. And so we run everything by these brand managers and make sure it's on brand from a Pass perspective for um, Instagram and Facebook. But for um, platforms like Twitter, Snapchat, even now Instagram Stories, if we had to run everything by a brand manager, we'd pull our hair out. Like, well, you can't, you can't do this. So there are certain platforms where you have to be live and on the fly. Like you can have an idea of what you're going to post and and say, here, we're gonna cover this event this way. Okay, great, but there's no way you can get every single snap approved. And that's another thing from, as you're looking at a business case for social media, um, don't try to do every platform. See what works for your brand specifically, your company. Um, just hearing Nicole talk about LinkedIn works for B2B, great, like that's awesome. Um, Snapchat doesn't, it's not for everyone. Yes, a lot of people are using it right now, a younger consumer, um, but it doesn't mean your brand needs to be there. Um, so that's just, you know, my two cents on that. Um, so just on that subject, and maybe Tara, you can speak to this you guys are talking about um, channel specific content and posting to one channel versus the other. Yeah. Um, can you explain the importance of like posting organically natively to one channel or like is your software, yeah. like can you, can you kind of speak to like channel specific content? For sure. Um, so a lot of the people that use our, our software are YouTube creators, YouTube stars. Um, so they their main audience is based on YouTube. Uh, but the discovery mechanism, so where there's other parts of their community live on Facebook, 
Twitter, Instagram, there are people everywhere that are interested in this content. The thing that they don't do is they don't take that YouTube video and just share a link to that to Facebook. They actually are going in and making a native Facebook video, which our software does very easily, um, so that they're creating a clip that's relevant, really quick, easy, fast, not a six minute long video that they're putting up on Facebook because Facebook feeds are going quickly now. So you have to make sure that you're doing something that is specific to that social platform. Twitter, who is gonna watch a seven minute long video on Twitter? Or, and you know, you might wanna do a GIF or a meme. So there's all of these different types of media that you can put out across these different platforms. Um, I think that, you know, if you think of yourself as a consumer, so for myself, when I'm going through a Twitter feed, I like it to be quick and fast. So I'm not going to go and put a video or something that isn't going to be eye-catching and really quick, right? Um, on Facebook now, obviously, I'm sure that everyone knows that because of your, the way your feed is, Facebook native video is reign supreme. So if you have a native video in your post, they will prioritize it in everyone's feed. Now also live is really important on Facebook, so you're gonna wanna start thinking about those things. Uh, with Instagram, you know, Instagram video is pretty interesting. Uh, I think that now with the stories too, that's kind of shifting. It's really important to just try and stay on, as a consumer of these products as on top of things as possible so that you can then come up with your own strategies for your business or your brand or whatever it is because it's the way that you're consuming it. You want to actually be pushing it out to your to your customers. Um, but I really, really, one of the main things that we really push is that you should never put the same exact post across everything. Like that is not something that is going to work because your audience on Twitter is different than your audience on Facebook, is different than your audience on YouTube, and it all should be tailored specifically. It doesn't have to be something that's like a long drawn out process, but just changing that piece of content. So it's a photo with a link to a video as opposed to the actual whole video itself. And then for everyone else who's not on it, they're afraid. Or did you have something to say about it? Yeah, just, yeah, just me. So, okay. uh, you know, it's kind of the consensus seems to be uh, being where your community is and utilizing social media not to advertise yourself, but to be a part of your community and your consumer's community. Uh, Reddit's really, really huge in the industry that I'm in because it's where the community lives, there and on Twitch and on YouTube. And I get more engagement on Reddit than I do on any other social media. So it's about knowing your audience, knowing your community and where they're at. Um, we were talking previously and somebody brought up that Anthropology has given each individual store their own Twitter handle and their own Instagram handles, which is huge because now it's not just Anthropology. It's Anthropology Pasadena. It's my community, Anthropology. And it takes a corporation and brings it down into a community. And I think that's really what social media strategy is all about. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that too because it's all about really building your community, right? And your followers and engaging with these people. And this is just a tool. Um, when I started learning about social media and community years ago, community building, which is what I specialize in now, it was told to me a community can't exist online if it doesn't exist in real life. So it's all about as many of these people that you can engage with and meet. And I was um, building a community from scratch for a, a music app. And I must have met more of those people in real life and took them out for pizza and coffee and engaged with them. And it makes them feel really special too. So as many of these people that you can meet in real life is great and it helps them and it makes them feel special. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really important. So everyone wants to feel important. But um, not Tara, maybe because you are a platform. But I want to hear everyone else's opinion on using third-party platforms to post as opposed and scheduling posts as opposed to posting natively on Twitter or scheduling on Twitter, uh, scheduling on Facebook and posting direct on the sites. Do you use a third-party platform? What are your feelings on that? What platform do you like if you do use one? I don't. I tried um, doing the third party, um, but it wasn't. It just wasn't organic for me, and your followers really know when you're not doing something organically. Um, I do a lot of happening now, and I just feel like it, for me, it takes more time to create the post because you still have to post it, um, so I'll do a lot in notes. And here's another tip. I have all my hashtags so I can just copy and paste them. So 
So that's a very easy way. All my coffee hashtags, cut and paste. All my fashion um, hashtags, cut and paste. So personally, on my level, I do not um, use it. Uh, yeah, for us, um, we don't. We, we post straight to the platform that, that we're sharing the content to. Um, we do use Sprout Social, but it's more of like just a listening listening tool um, in real time. We never post through it. Um, but it, what I found is Facebook specifically would, would basically degrade content if you use the third party. So that's why sharing the video and uploading it directly to Facebook versus putting a YouTube link in. I mean, Facebook wants to own all your content. That's basically what it's coming down to. Um, but it, they, they prioritize it and so Brands like ours obviously want our content seen by as many people as possible, so um, we play ball with them. So that's, that's what we do. We use Sprout Social as well, which has great tools for scheduling posts for Twitter or to spacing out your tweets on Twitter. I totally agree with Paul. And when it comes to Facebook, Facebook is constantly changing the way that you can upload posts and import photos. And that's just never going to be up to speed with any third-party tool. Um, so it does degrade your content, and it is in that situation best to use Facebook. Um, but there are some tools like Sprout Social, which we use on the agency and on the multi-approval level process. It does make it easier to have that transparency, especially when you have multiple teams working on social media posting, to know what's going out when. Um, so you're not stepping on each other's toes when you're, say, doing a tweet or scheduling out some sort of response. Um, it's great for customer service as well, so you can tag someone to respond to a particular question. Um, so it's a constant balance, um, but there are some tools that are great, but I would say, when in doubt, always go straight to the native app. Yeah, I think that's really great feedback too, and I know that, so what I used to do at Complex is we had so much media all the time, so much traffic, that we probably used five different analytics tools and scheduling platforms. Um, for different things. We were running branded content for Pepsi.com, and I know that our branded content team is using one called Simply Measure that's a highly social analytic tool. Um, I was running content syndication with Business Insider, Huffington Post, Yahoo, MSN, and, uh, MSN and CBS, and um, sending them the content every morning that was, was um, getting a lot of traffic on our site. So I used one called Simple Reach, so I could see what was trending on social and what was getting ready to do well. So I would send those out. And then um, I was also running four different social accounts at one time. So I had 10 interns working under me who was writing social copy all day long. So it was like a lot of um, action there. But um, we used a platform called Social Flow that I'm personally in love with. Um, it gives them a really amazing dashboard. It has a speedometer. As you're writing a tweet, it would tell you how well it's going to do. Oh, if you change this word, it kind of go back down. And then you could set it to post at a certain time. So you'd say, I want this one to go out on Tuesday between 9 a.m. and noon. And then it would let it fly when the conversation was peaking. So like, they're really cool, interesting tools. And we're happy to talk to you about any of these things that we know about. Um, and then the fact that these tools are constantly changing and tech is evolving all the time, it's really interesting to um, stay on top of these types of things. Do you have any personal way that you do stay on top of these tools and different platforms that come out? And do you test these or you just sort of like to stick with the main platforms because it tends to be better? I mean, I think for me, the way that I find out about all of these tools is through events like this or just talking with coworkers. Um, uh, Mashable is a great resource for anything social media. There's no shortage of blogs out there that give best practices, that offer tools. Um, there's always the 10 best tools for listening, the 10 best tools for retweeting, the 10 best tools for finding the best um, hashtags. So there's no shortage of, um, of options that are available. It's, there are some that are paid that um, you know, can get on the pricey side, but there are amazing tools that are also free. And it's just really finding the resources and staying in touch with um, colleagues that are also in the same industry and have the same questions and you know, kind of balancing and bouncing ideas off of each other. So yeah, I actually find places like this to be um, just an awesome place to talk, talk to people, see what other people are using, just idea share um, from a tools perspective. I think from a platform perspective, it is very dependent on uh, where your consumers are. I know we've, we've talked about this before, but um, 
like Snapchat we were considering, and then it's like, well, we need to reach a younger demographic. Uh, not too young, so, so uh, but, but I end up, I mean, they don't offer any solutions, so I actually, me and, and another person on my team have to manually go through and if someone snaps us and it's like, okay, you're underage, we block them, and it's like, that is so tedious, but it's, we, we have to be there because there's so many people there. Um, and I think as we even look back, there's um, recently Tumblr has reemerged as a platform for us, mostly because of art and all the things we do with art. The artist community there is huge, just in the same way Reddit is huge for, for you and what you do in Twitch. Um, you have to look at sort of uh, who you're marketing to and or who you just want to talk to and see where they're at and uh, focus on those platforms. Um, I, another thing that we do if we have a question like what you're looking for is that I'll throw it out onto Twitter and I'll tag people and say, hey, I'm having this issue. Um, Zendesk is a tool that we use for customer support. And I reached out to them and said, you know, I was having an issue with our reporting. They got back to me right away and they tagged another person that ended up um, giving me a solution. So I would say use social media to your advantage. There's, again, no shortage of resources that are out there. Paul, you could probably throw out that question about Snapchat and maybe somebody you know, we'll get um, flagged for it. LinkedIn is really great about monitoring those conversations. I actually saw it happen earlier this week where somebody was happy about um, certain posts being removed from their feed and the CEO of LinkedIn actually commented and at mentioned the director of product development. Um, so these conversations are watched and there are people that are willing to help and that have solutions or are working on solutions. So I'd say don't be reluctant or hesitant to uh, throw those questions out on social. Real quick, I would also say, let me get you, let me get you. Um, Twitter is the best place for that. I would say uh, Facebook comments on that company page, it's kind of hard to really reach them, but Twitter is a really great platform to um, interact with brands and get your questions answered. First, thanks for saying that. Yeah, Twitter is absolutely uh, kind of the new ground for uh, customer relationships and especially customer service. Uh, Apple now has a customer service Twitter uh, specifically for tech support, so if you ever need any tech support, uh, you can tweet us at that handle and we can help you out. It's really fantastic. Um, so uh, going back to uh, finding out where your audience is and where your community is, Google Alerts, and if you want to spend some money, Brand24 are fantastic ways to find out who's talking about you and where they're talking about you. And that's free. Google Alerts, you can set them up for any the last company. Brand24, uh, that one actually scans all social media, um, but Google Alerts does as well. So uh, Brand24 just gives you more analytics and a little more in that. Yep, I'm a big fan of customer service through Twitter. Jet blue all day long. <laughs> um, so one thing that while we're talking about social media and social handles, can you guys discuss or explain why it's important that all of your handles are the same across every platform? Because that's a best practice, and I just think that everyone needs to understand why they need to keep it all the same. Um, I have um, Pasadena Charm across the board. And again, working with smaller companies, I've um, explained to them that it's so important for people to find you. Um, and again, going back to like J. Crew or Anthropology, um, you know, they only have one name. You'll can, you can find them across the board. Um, however, I like what these communities are doing and that they'll be Anthropology, or they're Anthro Pasadena. Anthro Newport Beach. Um, and the support for these small communities is huge and it's the reason why I'm sitting here today is the support from your community. So reach out to the people around you. Don't be afraid of your competition. They're actually, they're your biggest support. Um, and I find that um, now when I meet people, I say, hey, if you comment on my page, I'll comment on your page. And now my comments have doubled. And it's not about if um, your Instagrams or your posts, well, on Instagram, I can speak on behalf of Instagram. It's not in order anymore, it's by popularity. So finding ways to engage um, that way um, and just having people find you with the same name, I think, is extremely important. There's also services that you can go on. I think it's called Name Finder. 
right? And if you go onto something like Name Finder, you can actually type in the handle that you would potentially want to use, and it'll show you if it's available for various different sites, or if it's not available for Twitter, but it's available for Instagram or Facebook fan pages and things like that. So it's nice to be able to do it in one clean swoop. I, unfortunately, am still fighting with Instagram to get my Tara C. I will get it eventually. Um, the person doesn't even use it. I'm like, please. But, um, yeah, no, having consistency, even as a personal, like for me, it makes me crazy that I can't have the consistency across the board. Um, no, I'll just say, I'm not a huge believer in new social media, new emerging social media platforms personally, but something that I do and I would recommend you do Get on them as soon as possible, get in invites if you can, and grab your handles, yeah. just in case. Yeah, I'm very jealous if you have TRC, because it's pretty incredible, because you're not TRC with a bunch of like numbers behind you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Just real quick, also to speak to that point, because I know that you might notice that my handles are at Master Bay. I don't take myself very seriously, and I think social media, depending, you know, it, I wouldn't overthink it. Like, just choose something that's relevant to what you like. Um, I worked at a hip-hop company. Master P was a, is a hip hop person, and everyone in my company called me Master P, so that was how Master <laughs> Pay came. <laughs> so that's how I'm Master Pay. Um, I'm the master of my domain. So. Just a small <laughs> thing to add to this, because uh, we have brands who are inactive on social media that had a huge love in their regions. Old Style Beer was one of them. Um, and we had to reach out to the to the consumer who had the handle. So a lot of times they're fans of your brand um, who just want to see your brand succeed. So if someone has your handle, a lot of times just DMing them or messaging them and just saying like, hey, we love what you're doing. Um, we're ready to, to start marketing this. But honestly, we reached out to the guy and, and uh, he was like, yeah, I'll do it for a case of beer. And we're like, yeah, done. So, so uh, it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty easy switch. But it was one of those things where, you know, if, if your brand is loved and, and you're a little late to the game, um, it shouldn't be that hard to sort of work with that person who has them, so. That's actually a really interesting story because that's how Disney's uh, Facebook handle started, was by two, like, mega fans. And Disney reached out to them and they ended up for a time being, I don't think they still do it now, but when Facebook was first starting, they allowed them to run the Facebook page uh, with authorization through Disney. Um, but there are some tools as a business owner, like if your brand is trademarked, you do have some um, legal backing to be able to take over that um, handle. So there is some things through Twitter and through Facebook and resources that you can reach out to. Um, sometimes it is a lot easier just to reach out to that person and say, hey, we kind of want this handle. Like, are you willing to negotiate with us? Um, sometimes you do need to get creative with different wording. Um, sometimes, and we just went through the, this recently with one of our clients, um, they used to be Dale Brothers Brewing, not their last name Brewing. So we had to go through and change all of their social media handles. So there are resources and ways to do that if you do need to change your name. Um, it is a tedious process, and sometimes you do need to reach out to the right people at Twitter or at Facebook. Um, but definitely, it's great to have those tools to see what's available. Make sure consistent that you have consistency across all. If you can, sometimes you just can't, and you have to get creative. Um, so I think we're getting close to maybe time here. Uh, but I wanted to ask you guys, what sort of trends do you see coming down the pipeline? Is video a thing? Carrie, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. Um, and you know, just the importance of that, or, or what sort of new things do you see coming down the pipeline? What should people pay attention to? Video is for sure um, the, the main content source that I see emerging. Um, not only just video, but live video. Um, there are a lot of uh, digital media properties that are now being paid to do live video streams on on Facebook. So like even like the cooking channels are now being paid to do like their you know Bon Appetit is constantly live streaming. Like I'm like what the. Every two minutes, they're doing a new like recipe. Uh, so I think it's really important to just try and uh, you know read as many trade publications as you can. Um, I think you know I live and breathe in the video world, so I have a very like that's where I see a lot of trends shifting. Uh, but I do think that video is probably like coming down the pipeline. Yeah, absolutely, and especially specifically live video. Uh, 
you can't say enough about how strong actual live interaction is with your consumers and with your, you know, your fan base. Uh, I mean, the entire industry that I'm in was basically literally built by players streaming themselves practicing and answering questions live from people in Twitch chat. And from that, we have a $98 billion industry. I mean, it's massive. And if you don't think that that's going to apply to your industry as well, then you're wrong. Uh, that's <laughs> So also, guys, um, what are some of the greatest misconceptions you think people have about social media? What, what do you think that people are doing wrong? Like, is there something that they think that people are could do better, or they're doing wrong, or is there? I would never, and I don't recommend ever buying followers. Um, I get a lot of um, people that like my photos, and you probably do too, that say, 1-800, get more followers, and I always block them. Um, it goes back to that organic community, and I, I did a lot of giveaways when I first started passing the charm. And I would get, you know, 200 new followers, great. And then I would do another one, great. Well, as soon as that giveaway was over, you would you would lose a bunch of them. So it's good because you you gain a lot and you lose a little. But as soon as you announce who the winner was, you're potentially telling everybody that they lost. And then they, you are. You are. So then, again, practice makes perfect. perfect. Don't so <laughs> practice makes perfect. Now I would get people off and say, "Hey, the the winner will be announced on Snapchat on this date." And then sometimes I would even delete the giveaway. So giveaways are good. You just have to be very, very careful. It is a pitfall. Don't buy followers. Be organic. Um, and reach out to the companies that are doing the same thing that you are because there's a huge way for you guys to support each other. Um, and one more tip is to just ask a question on across the board, um, you know, all your social media. Ask a question. What do you guys think about this? Where should I go tomorrow? What's your favorite coffee shop? And you're just going to see people answer as opposed to them just looking at your picture and moving on. Give them something interesting. I said, I put a picture up of the Colorado Bridge and I said, can you put, can you describe this in three different emojis? And people had so much fun putting three emojis and it was just interesting to see what, what people responded to. People want to react. Yeah, and uh, sort of a rebuttal to what you're saying about uh, engaging with you know, your competitors. Another way to look at that is what we do, which is um, look at what Bud or Miller was doing and never do that. So, um, and it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we, we want to differentiate ourselves in as many ways as possible. And sometimes you can't, like, uh, is Bud posting Instagram? Yes. Are we? Yes. But what is that content and what does it look like? Theirs looks like an ad. Like, every post is like it was a done at the scene photo shoot. Um, a lot of what we do comes from our consumer. Um, so, it's, it's one of those things where, um, look at what your competitors are doing. If there's a way to align, maybe do that. If there's a way to differentiate yourself or call them out, do that. So, I mean, you guys made some great points already. Um, but to sharing consumer content, I think it's very important to you know engage with them and reward them for tagging your brand in things and mentioning you guys on social media. It's nothing to retweet. It's nothing to repost a picture on Instagram. Um, People love that, you know, they love feeling appreciated and noticed. So uh, the more you can do with that, as long as it fits into your brand image, uh, you definitely should. Um, but yeah, I think the matching luggage thing was very important earlier, making sure your handles are really great, just the same across all platforms because people find you in different places and they use different platforms. So if you have, uh, say, PBR underscore on Twitter, but they're like more of a Facebook person, they'll, you know, it all depends on really what they're used, they're comfortable using, that's where they'll find you. And as long as the message is still the same across those platforms, you'll get the business, so. <laughs> I just have one small thing to add. I think it might kind of contradict what Taryn was saying, so I apologize for that. But um, <laughs> um, from a different perspective, um, I would say a common misconception is that if you build it, they will come. If you tweet, people will engage. That's not always the case. And so I would um, challenge, sometimes we challenge our, our clients and um, colleagues to try paid tactics. Um, Facebook and Twitter tactics are very advanced now. You can get very targeted. 
Um, P&G is now changing their whole social strategy to now refocus on how they're addressing paid. Uh, that I'm really interested to see what's going to happen there. Paid is changing. You can get um, targeted down to the zip code, targeted down to the, to the interest. So there's a way to find the right people. Um, the algorithms are changing, and so again, if you build it, it doesn't mean that people are going to find you. Sometimes you do need to pay to play, and I would just be really strategic in the way that you do that. Don't cast a wide net. Make sure that you're casting the, right, the net to the right people. That's a really great point. I like that. And then we do need to wrap up, but I want to just, so what you're saying about contesting, uh, I ran a complex contest, and I did build our email subscribers to nearly a million over a two-year period by contesting. Um, and also to that, um, there are a lot of, we use it in-house platform, but there are a lot of really great contesting platforms out there like Clean that will help you grow your, um, your all your followers across the board and, and you can, um, anytime any of our editors are like, great, we're going to give away an Xbox on Twitter. I'm like, no, through Twitter, do it for me so I can track everybody and get the analytics. So and there are these ways to do it. So it's not just straight buying followers, but, you know, and then they kind of would space out and forget that they're following you and all of a sudden you're so that's really great. But I think that we um, are all done here with our panel. So now we're going to open up the floor to Q&A. Um, do we have the working microphone for the floor? Oh, look, Apple's on top of it. So what was that called? Gleam, G-L-E-A-M. Gleam is a really good one. Hello. So I have a question, I forget the name, you're Taryn, okay, sorry. Uh, so you said that you ran a contest, and then right after the contest, you deleted it, and so I didn't understand what the point of that was. So I had a giveaway with 10 artists, and I was able to have West Elm have a gift card for $250. So how I did that was, um, you know, in order to enter, you like the post, you follow all these people, and you tag a buddy in the comments. That's a way to kind of generate some attention. Um, and then in the comments below, I say, um, you know, this will be announced on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Um, so after I announce the winner and I contact the winner, make sure you contact the winner and get a hold of them first. Because yeah, sometimes say, they're a fake. You have to, I've had to contact like 20 people before right. someone confirmed. Right. So, so you don't say, this is the winner. Right. You need to get them confirmed. So make sure you get a hold of that person and they're not a robot. And then I told all my artists, okay, you guys, you know, two days later, we're going to delete the post. One reason is because it was a graphic of like it just was a circle that said giveaway $250 and that doesn't look good on people's pages. And people might, I've had people go back and enter because they don't read the fine print. So that's a re another important reason. A, you don't want to remind people that they lost and B, you don't want to have this advertisement on your beautiful, cohesive Instagram page. I hope that answers your question. But initially you had your app, your graphic was $250 prize. Yeah, right? like I had a, a local calligrapher say, give away for $250, and we left it up for a week, generated people were tagging all their friends, find the winner, announce the winner, and then I told everybody that was involved, take it off your page. Because people, people really want to win that gift card, and they're going to go back to see who won, and then again, you just don't want to remind people that they lost. So I have a quick question on the, the video content. The, you talked about how important video was and things like that, but I, in my LinkedIn feed, there's a ton of people with their face next to the sort of camera and they are answering a question or they're giving, and it's just, it's not very engaging. And so I don't know how you can try and help the clients understand that despite the video being good, do something instead of just talking into the camera. I was going to juggle some planes up here for you. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't, LinkedIn is not necessarily, uh, in my opinion, a place that you can do video. Like I was saying, like you're not going to put a oh. two minute long video on Twitter. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily go to LinkedIn for a video 
strategy. Like I'm not, I don't know if that is going to change in the future. But as far as like a lot of the video creators that we work with are definitely like staring straight at the camera and they are talking to their audience and they are having a conversation with their audience. They call them friends. They don't call them fans. Um, they build a community around the the connection that they have. Um, and a lot of conferences that I go to that are fan conferences, like that they get to meet these YouTube stars, all of them think that they're friends. Like the fans are like, oh my God, there's Tyler, he's my best friend. And th these kids are really generating community. It's true, it's the craziest. The first time I went, I was like, this is crazy. But it really is something that um, they have tapped into a way to connect with a community that is very unique and authentic and like you were saying, it's organically done. They they build this, this community by asking questions, by asking what they want to see the next day, um, making sure that they are staying relevant and timely and not like going completely off topic. They have schedules that they're posting. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting um, world that we're, we're entering into here for sure. And I just want to add that uh, good video is good. Um, so the big thing, uh, you know, making sure that it's on the right platform, that it's targeted for the right people, that it looks great. If any of you are thinking about doing video content and you want a little help, we actually have an event on the 25th here, uh, mobile filmmaking with iPhone. Uh, so put that on your calendar if you're interested, and come on out. Where are you going to Oh, it'll be at 7 p.m. on August 25th. Thank you. I follow the strategist social media, and she says, the best way to make money is to get people off of social media. So, you know, you have to, it's great to have people follow you, do tweets, and have nice conversations, but how do you get them to actually spend money? How do you get them to come in, contact you, spend money, and make money? I'm actually dealing with that right now, and I met with an amazing person who's actually in this audience. Her name is Chelsea um, from Journey Communications, and she stressed the importance of getting I have all of my all of my eggs in one basket on Instagram, and it's changing. You never know. It could disappear, and then all my followers disappear. So she gave me this great idea about having a newsletter. I have a lot of companies now coming to me saying, how do we advertise with you? And I don't want to clutter up my website with a bunch of advertisements, so a nice newsletter and getting my followers off Instagram and onto your home base. You have to have that home base whether it's your website, I don't know. It's just so important, and she really opened up my eyes, so I'm actually working on that moving forward, getting people off that social media, because you don't have a handle on what they're gonna do next. So make sure you have that home base. And uh, that's why the, the email marketing is, is so important. Uh, for certain brands, we actually don't do email marketing, but um, it is very important um, for, for brands that are trying to convert sales. Um, I worked at Audi before past and both those companies, so for Audi, it's such a big purchase. They're really just marketing in hopes that eventually when they're going to buy a car, they buy an Audi. And, and that's their whole marketing strategy is exactly that, elevating the brand. Um, which is why the Audi R8 came out as like a supercar, as their halo car, and then they hope people bought the A3 based on the association. So um, it was, uh, and that's totally what it was, you know, they wanted like a piece of the R8, you know. Um, but with Pass, like I don't even have direct conversion sales because we're a three-tier system with beer. So um, we produce the beer, then we have to give it to the distributor, who then gives it to the wholesaler, who then gives it to the you. So um, it's it's one of those things where um, we don't have direct sales outside of our store, and so that's our, our really only um, um, direct conversion is for hats or shirts or merchandise. So it depends on your brand. Yeah. So I what he said, it's kind of like you got to look at social media as a platform to increase brand sentiment. You know what I mean? Creating. Um, so if PBR is doing something on social that you thought was funny, um, they have like maybe three good social comp, uh, posts that you like, like, okay, I'm a PBR customer. They've got some, got some good writers over there. This is interesting stuff. Um, you're just trying to raise the, the brand's place in your mind. Uh, so whenever you're at the liquor store and you're trying to figure out, all right, how am I going to get ready for the weekend, PBR is on top of mind from that funny video you saw earlier that they posted. It's like little things like that. You're playing a game. Um, 
know the consumer to not only engage with them, but to, you know, hold a place in their mind and hopefully it's a good place in, in their mind. Um, from that, you can get the calls to action and stuff like that. But it's really about creating that community, creating a good feeling within that community and trying to carry that over to a purchase. Yeah, and to also speak to that, right now at Echo Factory, we're producing a 45-day paddleboard tour for a, a water sports company in the oh. Netherlands that's getting introduced to the U.S. And so we're tweeting at local companies in the river and lake communities that we're visiting. People are coming out in droves, and they're buying paddleboards. And so it's like we're just promoting the tour and the activity of, you know, the RV that we have going around that's talking to local communities. The people are showing up, and then they're buying paddleboards, and so they're seeing that there, too, and it's all just being promoted well, heavily. So just one last thing to add is we're thinking about like social media and ways to drive traffic to the to the properties that you own. Um, your website should also be considered as social media. You have blog content, the content that you're putting on your website. You can further promote that and syndicate that on Twitter and Facebook. Um, but pushing your own your own content isn't necessarily a bad thing. You should have a balance of it to where you're not overly promoting yourself and your own products. But use social media to drive to your website, to drive to a newsletter, to drive to email subscriptions, so that you have a way of retaining that customer base. This may sound really like trivial, but making sure that your website or wherever you want people to go, make sure that that is linked out on your Facebook page and on your Instagram. Like I work with a lot of people that are like, oh, I didn't even realize that I didn't have website there or whatever that driving the traffic driver that you want to do right. you know, on, that, on everything Facebook. on your website as well like on your Facebook, Facebook fan page mind. make sure that your website is there if that's where you want people to go or whatever on Instagram change the link in the in the handle and the profile if you want them to go to a specific place um, just make sure that you're telling people where to go and that they actually can get there because that happens a lot but it doesn't work so Nicole just to um, clarify a term to um, push your own content. So that means, for instance, I post you know, strategy for investing in Brazil on LinkedIn. I post on Twitter and say, go read my LinkedIn article. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so from the strategy perspective, and I don't want to go too deep here, but we look at media as paid, earned, and owned. So your owned media is your website, your blog, anything that you have full control over. Your earned media is what people are saying about you, um, reviews anything that you have partial control over. And then your paid media is like your traditional, um, which is like paid advertising, boosted posts on Facebook, um, you can even take it down to traditional billboards and all of that. But your owned media is where you own all of that content and you want to be constantly driving traffic there. That's where you can drive conversions, that's where you can monitor traffic, where you can really own the conversation. And so you really want to make sure that where you're posting, there's this um, ecosystem of content that's driving back to where you're going to get the most things for your back, and that's going to be in all of your own media. I think we have time for a couple oh, questions. Okay. Hi. 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 Thanks so much, everybody. Um, I'm just curious, like, it's all good, and generally, so far, I've only had, like, a little bit of negativity in terms of media, and so I reached out to that person and kind of cultivated. Um, how do you all deal when things are seem a little problematic or you're not getting a, you know. <laughs> That's a great question. So uh, one of the, the hard parts about social media is that there is no filter and people can really say whatever they want. And for a lot of our clients, we do a lot of online reputation management. And um, one of the biggest things that our clients want to do is just delete a post and get rid of it. I highly, highly, highly recommend against that. The best thing you can do is to turn somebody that's negative into an advocate. And the only way to do that is to address their question head on. So if someone is being negative, whether it's a Yelp review or um, you know they've had a poor customer support experience, reach out to them, have that open conversation, and sometimes there just isn't a resolution and it will come down to having to remove a post. But in most cases, people just want to get their problem solved or feel like they're being addressed, and social is the best platform to do that in. Uh, in my world, so it's interesting. Uh, so we announced a lot of social on Facebook for various artists. More, most recently, I spoke to Lauren Hill about Lauren Hill earlier, and a little bit of background about Lauren Hill tours and shows. She's been known in the past couple of years to show up uh, 
like two, three hours later. <laughs> or not. <laughs> so we went on the tour last week in here and like, oh my God, this is great. I can't, I would love to go to this, but only if she would show up on time. So it's like, you can't, you can't engage with everyone, but it's also like, all right, if there's something witty in there that you can reply back to them with or something hopeful, um, do it. And also reward the people who made uh, good comments, positive comments with a like or smiley face, whatever it is uh, for your brand. Um, that's also important too. Just quickly, don't feed the trolls. You know what I mean? Yeah. And what I mean by that is people are going to hate on whatever you're doing because they're on the internet and they think they're anonymous and, you know, like, it's just going to happen. Do not engage with them. So if there is a legitimate concern, address it. If they're just like, I hate Lauren Hill, but you don't say like, oh, I, hey, I'm sorry about that. How can we make this better for you? You know, like, you don't, you don't do that. So, um, and just be, be mindful of that and, and make sure that the things you're responding to aren't the legitimate questions, so. Do any of you use webinars as part of your strategy after you engage? So the only time we use a webinar at apps is actually to uh, basically detail our marketing platforms internally. Um, and what I mean by that, so it's not a social media thing, it's actually an internal um, device that we use to talk to the distributors and say, here's looking at 2017, here's what we're planning on doing to get everyone on the same page. Um, but yeah, I mean, for past, there's not a lot of training to uh, opening up your hands. <laughs> potential for that. There's always industry-specific platforms that are looking for that video content, and if you're willing to produce it and hand it over to them, they're more than willing to put it on their website. I'll just say, um, as somebody that handles B2B relationships for Apple, uh, if you, are there software developers out here? Anyone? Okay, nope. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> On that note, but anyway, the uh, point being that if you deal with B2B and there's anything regarding how to use your stuff, if people can get you in a webinar with their clients, uh, it's huge. I just wanted to say, if you're on a smaller level like I am, I do work with a lot of um, nonprofit people that maybe don't have the funds in the beginning to pay to play. There are definitely tricks and ways that you can go about building um, your audience. Um, without having to get to that point, but working to that point because I definitely am looking forward to getting to that point. But we all have to start somewhere, and so you just kind of, you gotta just go for it. Is there another question? Good question. Oh, here. Yeah. Um, just for the small business owners in the audience specifically that don't have big teams and big time, and a lot of some of the things that you guys are talking about are you know, agency related and they sound all good in practice, but like, I don't have to do any of that. Um, what can I leave here and do at 10 o'clock that can make a big difference in my social media presence? Well, oh, well, I'll just, I'll start and you guys can definitely chime in. And I think that, you know, Nicole was kind of speaking to this before too, like maybe take a step and say, what social media platforms am I already on? And which one's relevant for me? Like where are the people that I'm trying to reach living online? Where are these people hanging out online? Like, like, do you have an Instagram? Maybe then you start that Instagram, make sure it's in line with your other handles. And then putting together, maybe just a weekly content calendar, like if every Monday or every Friday or Saturday or Sunday, just take an hour, you're like, what am I gonna post this weekend? At least writing something down, you know, putting it in like a Google Doc or somewhere where you can track it and always kind of access it and say, you know, am I gonna every Tuesday make a post about such and such? Um, do I have an old, something old that I can talk about or something that happened over the weekend that's a fun post that I can do? It's still timely. Um, but I think something small like that with like a, a minimal like weekly content calendar could help. And then um, just going back and looking at all your platforms and making sure that either the handles are all the same, that they're easy, easy to find on your website, that people aren't having to search around and 
to the bottom of the page. I think that everything works better if it's up top with icons and easily clickable and making the right thing. And Twitter's like Twitter, you know, Facebook's like Facebook. Really, it also depends on, I don't know what, what you're running social media for, so um, something smaller, like it helps to engage the community. I know I said that for us it doesn't, but it does help to engage similar like-minded people who are doing what you're doing um, and actually comment and talk to them. Um, if anyone is posting about your product or your brand, talk to them, like them, follow them. Like do something that, that draws them in to say, okay, this is somebody I want to engage with regularly or I want to see their content. Because um, we don't pay, we don't, we don't pay to play. Like it perhaps it's something that we don't advertise, we don't do it. So everything we built has been from an organic fan base. Um, now we have 172 years of brewing beer, um, but it's one of those things where um, you know you have to sort of build that from the ground up and the ground swell that that you create. So that's what I recommend. Does Karen have anything? What? Does Karen have anything? Oh. I mean, I would just add to the, the community and that, um, you know, just finding the ways to get yourself noticed at the top and, you know, reaching out to those other communities, finding that tribe. Um, just a quick example, I had a mommy friend on Instagram. She had the same exact amount of followers that I did, but she was getting triple, triple likes, quadruple comments. So I looked at her comments. So. Do your research. I looked, why is she getting so many comments? Well, half of them were her responding to these other moms. Oh, thank you. Oh, what are you doing this weekend? So instead of having um, 30 comments, now she has 60 comments. And she was ending up on the top. And I said, how is she ending up? We have the same exact amount of, of people going on here. And um, just like moms have a community, teenagers have this community. So you have to find your community and and it will blow up. So that's something you can really take away and start doing today. Yeah, I think that we're out of time, and I know that some people ask more questions, so we're going to.